So, so Lord, Lord Deben is the, uh, is the chair of the Committee on Climate Change. Uh, for those of you who perhaps uh, aren't British, slightly less familiar with the things, the, the Committee on Climate Change is the, uh, is the statutory body that advises the government and in fact reports to Parliament, so it has a considerable degree of independence on um, uh, meeting its carbon uh, setting and meeting its carbon targets, carbon budgets, and uh, the various kind of details and, uh, and how that's uh, progressing. Uh, Lord Deben has a, a long uh, career uh, and concern uh, for environmental matters, uh, was a former Secretary of State for the Environment in the previous Conservative uh, administration, so a very considerable track record in, uh, in, in, in taking these things forward for us. I'll spare his blushes uh, uh, in terms of saying anything else. Um, just over to you. Thanks very much. Very interested to hear what you've got to say. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, and it uh, happens to be rather convenient to be able to come so soon after the Paris uh, Accord, or whatever we're going to call it. I know we're not supposed to call it a treaty, because otherwise the Americans have to put it in front of Congress. But as long as it's not technically a treaty, they don't have to do that, so they can sign up to it. Most the Americans have signed up to no, um, uh, no international treaties of any kind, uh, except military ones, since uh, about 1950s. Not a good idea not to get the chance to throw it out. They haven't signed the six ITs or uh, the Law of the Sea or anything else. They just obey them, but they can't sign up to them. They just have to go through through Congress. But uh, it just shows the delicacy with which we had to approach this. And I do start by being very, very much more enthusiastic than I thought I would be, having promised to come and speak to you after it, because uh, I think. This agreement is much closer to uh, what we had hoped in our wildest dreams than what I thought was going to happen. And the reason for that is that I do think that it has now changed the whole course of events in the sense that every businessman throughout the world knows where we're going. Now, we may take longer to get there. There may be more uh, difficulties on the way. We may find all sorts of traps. But nobody who is advising anybody in business now can say other than that we are moving from the fossil fuel age into a new age uh, of low carbon economies. And that will make a huge difference. It then also means, secondly, that governments have actually got to excuse not doing things instead of arguing to do things. That's a, a different circumstance for governments, all governments. And, uh, Thirdly, it means that treasuries uh, are now faced with the issue that their governments have signed up to things that are bound to cost government money, at least in the short term, not necessarily in the longer term, because the fact is that most of the things that we need to do, we need to do anyway, and many of them are cost-saving in the end, if not in the beginning. But treasuries are always concerned about these things, and it doesn't matter what sort of government you have. As I go around the world, I always uh, talk about treasuries, and you see the smiles of recognition on people when I say all treasuries are always opposed to long-term climate goals. Not because they're gr not green, but simply they are opposed to any long-term goals. Because every time you have, oh, we'll see, um, every time you have a long-term goal, what you, uh, what you do is to restrict the ability of... Um, uh, of treasuries to uh, act exactly as they want to. Treasuries always want to be entirely in charge of uh, the money, and you can understand that. What they don't want to do is to have any restrictions on their freedom of movement. And uh, even though they may say, oh, well, we are always going to do these things, they don't want to be forced to do so. So that is the next thing which this has done. It has meant that treasuries now recognise that the argument is about how to do things, not whether you're going to do it or not. And that really does change the argument. Uh, the fourth thing is, for me, the most important thing, because it is the great change in the way human beings operate. I mean, ever since the beginning of time, uh, human beings have been, uh, without doubt, imperialist. Since the first village bashed up its neighbour in order to get the grazing rights, we've been like that. And, and it's very difficult to see a, power, a, a period in human history in which that has not been the driving force from Babylon right the way through to the Soviet Union. Uh, the great empires have operated on that way, and America as an empire. 
poor Americans have become an empire to exactly the point in which you can't be an empire. That's a very tough thing for them. But we, we have moved into a world which isn't like that anymore for a very simple reason. And that is that it is not practically possible to achieve the things we have to achieve on the basis of domination. The only way you can achieve the things you have to achieve is on the basis of consensus and working together. And human beings have always been very bad at that. We've never tried it properly, and we certainly find it extremely difficult, as we know in our own lives. It's much easier to have a, uh, a, a command and control approach than to try to work a, as a team. And yet we also know that if you can make working as a team actually operate, then you get better results out of it. But it's not what human beings are very good at. And I just do think we've underestimated and understated the significance, the philosophic significance, of getting 192 or whatever it is nations together, of getting them to agree something which affects them all differently, but is something they all have to do in order to protect themselves against something that will affect them deeply and uh, enormously. And to do it in circumstances where it actually means that everybody is admitting that this new way of looking at our neighbours is now essential. And I mean, you can put it like this. For generations, longer than that, uh, philosophers have talked about the brotherhood of man and theologians have talked about the fatherhood of God, but it hasn't been a practical necessity. What has happened is that that which has been a philosophic or theological concept which many have held to, although not many have followed, has now become a practical necessity. Because you can't do what the world has to do unless you do it on the basis of partnership and unless you do it on the basis of mutual respect. And our problem has been that even in the post-imperial world, if you like to put it like that, the rich nations have continued to work as if they were the imperial powers. Uh, I don't blame people for that because that's the habit they've got into. And if you're rich, as we know in a society, if you're rich, then you get used to getting your own way. And you don't quite understand why you can't buy your way. Uh, and, and actually, that's not possible in the world that we live in today. Mind you, you may have to pay for it. That's a different issue. And that seems to me the fifth big change, which is really hugely important, which is that for the first time, uh, the rich nations have made it absolutely clear that they accept that they have to pay the cost of the transition. Now, you can be mealy-mouthed about this. You can say, well, it's, they haven't given quite as much money as I think they ought to. And that's probably true. But the size of the uh, promise and the amount of money actually on the table is far beyond anything that has ever been given in this sort of way before. And the mechanisms by which it will be dispersed are much more egalitarian, if you like, much more uh, partnership mechanisms than anything we've ever had before. So it may not be as much as some people would like. I, I heard a rather unhelpful comment by Oxfam, which is increasingly unhelpful compared with the other aid agencies. And it was unhelpful in the sense that it was complaining when what it ought to have been doing was saying, thank goodness we've got as far as this, can we go further? I do think there's a very important element in all this of saying thank you when you've managed to get people to do what you want them to do. And as in this particular case, we've got some pretty difficult people to do things which we didn't expect them in the end to do. I think one has to start off um, with a, uh, a, a degree of celebration and, <coughs> and gratitude. I mean, there's a good story coming out of the, uh, the whole issue, which I don't know if it's true. No, nobody quite knows whether it's true, and we probably never will know. And that was that at the very last minute, that uh, highly upstanding uh, government, the government of Venezuela, decided that it was uh, going to tell the chairman that it was going to refuse to sign up. Well, of course you have to have everybody signing up. You, this is the curious and very, very valuable thing, but still very difficult thing. It's not done by majority in any sense. It's not even overwhelming majority. It's not even a two-thirds majority. It has to be done by uh, a total consensus. And so they told uh, uh, the chairman that they weren't signing up. And we are told that the 
minister said to the chairman, and the chairman did a bit of phoning, and the Pope rang the president of Venezuela, and the president of Venezuela was soon told where they ought to be doing, and they went back to the minister and said, no, you're not, you are signing up, and so we signed up. So somebody said it's the first time we've had an international conference with divine intervention for a very long time. <laughs> so there is a certain truth in this. But um, uh, the, the, the truth is, uh, what has it actually established? I mean, first of all, it has established that we commit ourselves to an operational determination to reduce our emissions to the equivalent of a rise of two degrees and an aspiration to try to get that down to 1.5. Now, uh, if you'd ask me whether we'd even have mentioned 1.5 in the debates, leave alone put it into the final... Uh, document, if you'd asked me that two months ago, I wouldn't have thought it possible. And I think it's worth thinking for a moment how that happened. It happened because the British recognised that the vulnerable nations could be brought on board and could be split off from the G7783 or whatever it happens to be at the time, and that would be a hugely valuable thing because that would stop the situation of some of the rich countries who call themselves developing nations, like, for example, Saudi Arabia, being part of the, of the decision-making of that group, that we could actually get them who had every interest in doing something about this. And we could also get some of the larger countries, because the problem up to now is that the people who've been really concerned about 1.5 are Vanuatu and Kiribati and places that are sinking beneath the sea. I mean, if your country is sinking beneath the sea, you do get really very uh, concentrated about this issue. But they've never got other people on board, and, and the key country in this case was, uh, was Bangladesh. And Bangladesh, um, uh, of course, has a particular difficulty, because Bangladesh it, it has this... Uh, I mean, it, it's a country where, if you were thinking about it in objective terms, you wouldn't have anybody living there because it's all below the, the low sea level. And they are having to, re, they're having to resettle about 200,000 people a year. And this is growing all the time. And the fact that a, a big country, a country of uh, 180 million people, uh, joined with the smaller countries, and then we began to get a whole collection more who were really pushing for something much more ambitious than anybody had thought before, was a crucial bit of getting the pieces in. And then Britain was able to get the rest of the European Union on side on that. So you then got a really strong group. And then to make sure that that actually worked, the British offer of money, which was the most generous we've ever made, and certainly more generous than anybody expected, meant that two things happened. One was it gave credibility to getting these people together because there would be money for it. And it also ensured that the United Nations asked Amber Rudd, our minister, to deal with the financial side. Now, I only know from people outside, but I'm told that it was uh, absolutely she played a blinder on that and got everybody on side in two hours in the middle of the night. She started, I think, at half past five and finished at... Uh, uh, seven o'clock, um, they having been up all night, and she got everybody behind the financial package, which was crucial for the developing countries properly to come on board. And what was important there was, which again I don't think people have been serious enough about, is the, the difficulty of the world today in the sense that there isn't that straight division between developing countries and developed countries, which we used to think about, and which we did have in Kyoto. I was at Kyoto. I'm so old, I've been around for a long time. I was at Kyoto, and at Kyoto, um, it was perfectly simple to have that distinction. There were the countries which had grown rich uh, and largely on the backs of pollution, um, and there were the other countries who were developing. But if you look at a country like India or a country like uh, China, Although China has a very large number of very poor people, as does India, they also have a very large number of middle-class people and a very large number of rich people, ditto with India. So you can't deal with countries as a whole in that way without people who are poorer in rich countries asking why they should be contributing to people who are richer in poor countries. So you've got to start thinking of the world as a whole, and that's really the remarkable breakthrough 
uh, which happened in this occasion. So the, the divisions are not the same as they were. Uh, there are nuances, but the central fact is that we've all committed ourselves to work together to achieve this end. And then there's the question of how near we are to do it. Again, I think people are very uh, slow in that recognising that the, the brilliance of uh, Christiana Figueres, who has been organising this, has been to get people to put on the table their promises in advance, which was a, a, a very big breakthrough. Now, it doesn't add up to a world that only increases by two degrees, but it does add up to something which is below three degrees. Nobody thought that was possible. So if you've got commitments, admittedly, uh, you've got to make sure people fulfil those commitments, but if you've got commitments which has already got you down to there, when the Shell, uh, I mean, which is not a bad company, I mean, Shell had done all these um, uh, scenario planning, and Sh Shell was doing scenario planning about based upon the principle that we'd have a, a four-degree or a six-degree world. The fact is that people had signed up to something below a three-degree world. It was a, a huge advantage. And then if you, that gave us the chance of saying, well, then we've got to have a mechanism to recalibrate this all the time, because otherwise we're not going to get it down to two. And that's why the um, uh, five-yearly uh, rerun and uh, looking at where we are and getting people to, to move faster is a hugely valuable mechanism, because otherwise you'd have to have another COP like COP21 with all that to get any change. And even better that you're going to do the first one of those in three years' time, in 2018, and then do it every five years, so that in three years' time we can have a, another look at this. And that seems to me to be crucial to the whole concept. And the reason for that is that climate change is going to be more and more obvious as every year goes by. I mean, there is a real problem here, that getting people to act early enough so that it is not unbelievably expensive to achieve this end. But, of course, if you get people to act early enough, it isn't actually as, it, as, as pressing for many countries. I mean, we may have these terrible floods in Cumbria, and that may remind us that these are the worst floods we've ever had in Cumbria, and the last time we had the worst floods we were having in Cumbria was only three or four years ago. And we built um, state-of-the-art defences for it, thinking that that would save them. And the state-of-the-art defences turn out not to be good enough in such a short period of time. I remember when they opened the Thames barrier, and it was supposed to be moved about twice a year. It's now worth very often moved twice a week. And that's, that's the difference that's happened to the, to the world. We are in a different world. But it takes, it's taken time. It seems to me that as this speeds up, it's not a very happy sight, but as it speeds up, people will be more willing to say, my goodness, we really do have to do something about this, those who have been rather slow on it. And as people learn uh, how much can be done, uh, then it seems to me we will be able to ratchet that up and not only get to two degrees, but perhaps seriously move to what we really ought to do, which is the uh, aspirational target of 1.5. Now, business is going to play a huge part in I don't think there's a, a political issue on this. And one of the great pleasures in Britain is that we have a consensus uh, between all the political parties. We've had that ever since the Climate Change Act. And of course, the Climate Change Act gives us a unique position, which I'll say a word or two before I finish. But uh, the fact is that uh, there is no doubt that just as the market is strong enough to divert activity so that we don't get the solutions that we want, it's also strong enough to divert activity so that we do get the solutions we want. Um, the sort of argument that says the market is not uh, satisfactory in these areas is going to be the middle of the point. You've actually got to have the strongest system you possibly can have. And we know that command and control doesn't work. Uh, if you want to look at the worst areas of uh, environmental depredation, you just want to have a look at the countries behind the Iron Curtain under the command and control system. So what you've got to do is to make the market use all its strength and its power uh, to change the world. And what you're getting now is a wholly different situation because the leaders of major companies are saying, I mean, I just quote the chairman of Coca-Cola, we've been here for 125 years, we want to be here for another 125 years, unless we deal with climate change, we won't be. 
Um, now, that's the sort of view you're getting from GE that you're getting from uh, uh, most surprising countries. I mean, at least coca has been done this for about 10 years, but the, you take a company like General Mills, which has been very different in the past, and suddenly move around to see that it's not going to be able to sell its this, that, and the others unless it solves this problem. And, and like uh, many others, they discovered that there is a price that they have to pay for the ability to earn. And uh, that price is actually to fight the battle on climate change. And that's why we will get, it seems to me, technological breakthroughs that we uh, can't at the moment imagine. And I believe that, not in the sort of George W. Bush line, which is that something will turn up. That's not what I mean at all. But after all, five years ago, I would not have been able to suggest that the price of offshore wind would have come down to where it is now. I mean, I was the chairman of an offshore wind company. And I would have told you two years ago we couldn't do it down to the level we are. Because we couldn't. But what has happened in that time has been fantastic movement. Similarly, uh, if you take um, solar, then who could possibly have guessed that, that? I know nobody could because nobody did. The speed with which it came down, they always was going to get cheaper and cheaper, but not in the sort of way in which it's happened. And the fact is that now you have an international assurance that people are going to make money by doing these things. That will drive a wholly different path. I want to end with a few words about the British system, because I do think that um, although there are now about 12 countries that have something similar, we have achieved something which is really worth exporting and which has certain advantages, which we have to talk about because they're quite tough for other countries to take on. And sometimes I think we were amazingly lucky that we picked just the moment to put this whole proposal yeah. Now, for those who, who don't remember it, it is some time ago now, what happened was that the opposition, the Conservative Party in opposition, joined forces with Friends of the Earth to produce the climate change bill. And we then went round and got all the opposition parties to sign up, including the Protestant Unionists in Northern Ireland, which is not, not easy, as a matter of fact. But nearly didn't get it because the letter which was going to go to the Prime Minister mention the fact that if you go down into the ice 800,000 years, uh, you can see that the temperature has never risen as far and as fast as it has over the last 150 years. And the Protestant Unionists for the North Island said they couldn't sign that because the world had only operated for 86,000 years, so therefore they couldn't sign it. So with many, many years of political experience, I crossed out the words 800,000 years and put down for a very long time. <laughs> it did work quite well. And so we had everybody, we had 100% of the opposition, uh, but the government had a majority of some 50. So we signed up 100 Labour members who agreed that they would break a three-line whip in order to vote for this bill. And we then went to the government and said, here it is. Uh, you take it on. Be your bill. Of course, if you don't take it on, it'll be our bill. And you won't like that, because we're going to win. And the result was they did take it on. In the teeth of the opposition of the Treasury. Now, I don't normally use unsuitable language in cases like this, but I will tell you the story of the Treasury advisor who, when she discovered that they really had to give way, she walked into the Department of uh, uh, Energy and Climate Change. She threw the bill across the table and said, There's your fucking bill at long, you just have to have it. <laughs> so we did uh, win the battle. And so it is genuinely a cross-party thing. It is genuinely a parliamentary thing. It was the whole of Parliament. And eight people voted against it. They're still there. And there are still people like that. But then there are peculiar people in every walk of life. And you just have to accept that. There were a few people on the Labour side. There are more on the Conservative side, on the far right, um, who find, um, find climate change uh, embarrassing and difficult and inconvenient. But then say, oh, I would love climate change not to be happening. I never understand why people think that one's in a sort of plot to, to, to push this. Because actually, it's an extremely inconvenient thing. It does mean we've got to change the whole way in which we operate, and that is not easy. But uh, you have to face the facts, and the facts are there. 
And that's what happened. Now, what the Climate Change Act did was to set up an independent uh, committee. I'm the second chairman of it. Uh, apart from the chairman, uh, um, who can come from anything, but um, the uh, members of it are all um, very senior scientists who have been known as the best examples of science in this particular area, and some economists of the same time. And what we have to do is to produce <coughs> the budgets uh, for reduction in our emissions, which will give us the most cost-effective route to cutting our emissions by 80% in 2050. 80% was the first occasion in which government didn't fix the amount. They had proposed 60%. We had proposed in our original bill 60%. But the nascent Climate Change Committee, it hadn't even been set up, was asked to investigate and decide whether that was the right amount. And they decided that it was uh, too low and that it should be 80%. And again, with a very considerable opposition from the Treasury, we moved to um, 80% instead of uh, 60%. So that was a very significant success. And we produce these budgets, and the great trick is that we produce them now 12 years ahead. So you're asking people to vote on what we should be doing in 12 years' time, which means that if you're the member for Upper Witherington, you don't get too worried about how it's going to affect Upper Witherington. So you don't start having some local argument about it, because 12 years' time is quite a long time in the time of politics. So you can actually talk much more uh, seriously in the, in, in, in the real world instead of your immediate uh, <coughs> problems which you always have once you talk politically and locally. So we're now, on the, we're now on the fourth carbon budget, that's been agreed, and uh, well, the fifth carbon budget has been presented. We have to present it before the end of the year, so we had to present it before Paris. We'll then report to the government on whether we think that it should be altered in the light of Paris. We'll do some work very early next year to make sure that uh, we give the right advice. And the government has to legislate on this by June next year, which is another example of the good things in this Act, because it stops governments letting things slip. <coughs> you have to do it. We had to produce it before the end of the year. They have to legislate before June. So that means that you can't play the game of I agree with you that we'll put it off. And so we are now in that situation. And once the budget is presented to Parliament and Parliament votes on it, <coughs> it can't be changed unless the Climate Change Committee <coughs> says that the basis upon which it was produced <coughs> has changed so much that it needs to be tightened or loosened. And that's what happened over the fourth carbon budget, which was my first uh, uh, baptism of fire, really, because uh, there was a pressure to revise the fourth carbon budget. And uh, quite a lot of the press is that right. And um, the government uh, indicated that it was going to review it. And I said, well, I'm sorry, you can't. The act is quite clear. If there's any review, I do it. And what's more, I decide whether I do it. And when I've done it, I decide whether you can change it or not. You may not like that, but that's what the Act actually says, that you can't change it. And of course, that's crucially important, because otherwise, what would happen is that people would, would pass it 12 years ahead, and then when you got too near to it, they want to change it again. Um, and there was a great deal of chuntering around in the, in the discussion and all the rest of it. But in the end, the government accepted Yes, That's what the law did say. So I said, but I'm go to review it, because my view is that if you set a budget so far ahead, it's perfectly reasonable to review it nearer the time. And we reviewed it and saw that there was actually no reason for either tightening or listening it. It was about right. And now we've done the fifth carbon budget, and as I say, they have to legislate on that before, before June. And these budgets, of course, give us kind of security to people. Not a perfect one, there are lots of other things we should do. But it does mean that the government has a statutory duty to meet those targets. Um, it can't avoid meeting those targets. And if it did on a uh, consistent basis, so far it's not, has met them, 
But if it did avoid them on a consistent basis, then they could be taken to court. Now, I wouldn't take them to court, but I rather think I might be the witness for the prosecution. You see what I mean? So they have, in fact, to do that. And we, and we every year have to report on how far they've got and what the problems are and where they are falling behind. And we've now done this under three different governments. Um, and so far, it's worked uh, very effectively. Uh, it, it works because it is so tough. It works because what it's doing is dealing with two different kinds of time scales and putting them together. The democratic time scale, which means that you do have to have an election in five years, let's say. You have to do that, because otherwise democracy doesn't work. You must have a regular recall. And on the other side, you need to have uh, climate change decisions which are going to work over a much longer period. And no one's actually put these two together before. And what the Climate Change Act does is to do precisely that. It, it keeps the democratic oversight, but it does it in a way which ensures that you have long-term consistency of policy, which you need to have if you're going to deal with climate change. So that it means that as far as Paris is concerned, it may be that we recommend some changes, or may not, to the fifth carbon budget. But what it does mean is that Britain is on track in a very much more decided way than any other country in the world for 2050. And that is hugely important. Last point I want to make, which is uh, more contentious, but I, but I believe it's an important point. Um, and that is that Everybody has a role in life. Um, Cardinal Newman said uh, everyone has a vocation, and the lucky ones know what their vocation is. And um, everybody has that uh, role. And the role of the Climate Change Committee, first of all, needs to be very carefully defined. If I'm to keep the independence which we have, I must be careful about mission creep. So whereas it's perfectly right for me to say what the carbon restraints on aviation are, it's not my job to say whether you should have a new runway or not. My job is to say you've got to do it in a way which keeps within those targets. My job is an output job, always. And that's very inconvenient for people like me who've got views on everything. Uh, you know, I'd rather like to say something about these things, but I, I don't. The second thing is that we are concerned with, with ends and not means. So, as I said before, I don't mind if we achieve these ends by ministers standing on their head and waving their legs in the air. I don't mind at all. It doesn't matter to me how you do it. What you have to do is to do it. Our job is to make sure that you have enough in the portfolio to be able to do it. Our job is to work out a whole series of scenarios to show that it is possible to do it. But it is not for us to lay down precisely how you do it. It is for us to say whether the way you've chosen the government and parliament is actually meeting that. So every year we, we make those statements. And if they are not, then they've got to find ways of doing it. And if they don't find ways of doing it, then they do open themselves up to the legal process. And, and therefore, other people also have a role. Perfectly reasonable for... Uh, NGOs to make a great deal of fuss about uh, this or that change in government policy. My job is to say I'm not making comments about the change in the government policy because I'm not interested in the means. What I am saying is that if you do change that policy, you've got a gap and you've got to find something else that fills that gap. And if the government does find something else to fill that gap, then that would be perfectly reasonable and we'll reflect that in our statement of the situation which we will produce next year. But if they don't, then again, we will draw attention to where the gaps are. And that's how you do it. <coughs> the government then has to look again at that. And I think that uh, in order to help the government, we produced a letter after the changes which Amber Rudd had made and pointed out that there were perfectly good reasons for a number of changes which we perfectly understood, but there were some very real issues that had to be met. The control, the levy control framework, which is the basis of how we um, pay for uh, renewables and such like um, has got to be extended before beyond 2020 or some alternative which does the same job and we've got that commitment. 
we said that they had to do something about new houses, because although there were real arguments against the zero carbon homes program, not least that they proposed an on-site generation need, which is not very sensible. Um, it doesn't mean to say we can seriously believe that you should build homes now that we've got a retrofit in 20 years' time. So we've got to find something there. And we also accepted that the Green Deal hadn't worked as we hoped it would work, or they hoped it would work. And so they had to have a replacement. But they do have to have a replacement. And uh, all those things we've made absolutely clear. But it isn't for us to say this is the replacement, or that's the replacement, or that's the way you should do it. It is for us to say it's got to add up to what that end uh, point is. So that's where we are. I'm very pleased with what has happened. I think it is a moment in history in the sense that we are now clearly on a different path. It's a moment in history too, as I said earlier on, in which we begin to recognize that this is the biggest change in the way human beings look at each other since the Renaissance. And that's why I think we're very lucky to be living at this moment, because we're living at a moment of huge alteration in the way human beings operate. That's both dangerous, of course, and it's incredibly exciting. And we've got to make the best of it. Paris is not the end, it's the beginning. And it's the best beginning I could have imagined. Certainly much better than I feared, and better even than I hoped. So we go forward from here. And we'll have different answers in different places. But now, nobody can be in doubt that if they want to be profitable in the new world, they've got to have a low carbon answer. And that changes everything. Countries have got to recognise that there's now going to be a competition between countries to attract that sort of technology, those sort of businesses. So countries have got to think about how do I make sure that we do have uh, an atmosphere which will encourage people to come here rather than somewhere else. So that's a decent, a proper kind of competition between countries. And I suppose I end with two very short points, which are the first one very simple, that is that all of this would have been impossible, and it would mean that, without the European Union. Anybody who thinks that Britain would be better off outside the European Union better stop trying to be an, in any way an environmentalist. Because the only way we've managed to do this is with our needs. And anybody who thinks you can live in a world where you've got to get on with, your, with the whole world, who thinks that it's sensible to say you can't get on with your neighbours with whom you share history and... Uh, and, and religion and culture and all those things, but you are going to be able to get on with people who live millions of thousands of miles away with whom you share none of those things seem to me to be totally flat. I mean, the fact of the matter is our membership of the European Union is absolutely crucial to the environmental future that we have, and it is the European Union that has held this flag flying at times when no one else has. You think that America would have changed without the pressure of the European Union as the largest trading company uh, the country in the world? I don't know. And the last thing is, you can all help me, because uh, as chairman of the Climate Change Committee, I have the largest number of trolls on my Twitter feed of anybody in the country. <laughs> and they are particularly nasty, and therefore, if you have not joined my Twitter feed, it's uh, at Lord Deben. I'd like you to join it. You can then join me in dealing with the trolls. They uh, deserve to be dealt with, and the quicker we uh, dismiss, although let's tell you, there is a problem. I had a particular troll who was particularly nasty, who was called Jingle Balls. <laughs> and, um, Jim, Jingle Balls was really unpleasant. And I got fed up with him, but I don't ever turn anybody off. Oh, except one who kept on putting so many on that the whole thing became so big and I couldn't manage it, and it was all just nonsense. So, I've, other than that, I've never turned anybody off. And suddenly, about three months ago, Jingle Balls stopped trolling me. And I suddenly discovered a very curious human characteristic. I miss him. <laughs> and, and that's what I worry about him. I mean, I don't know whether he's alive or dead. He's here. Uh, and, and of course, because he never gave you his name, I have to. I, I just have to anybody you know, Jingle Ball, <laughs> perhaps you'd say, would he just tell me he's all right? Because it would help me an awful lot. Thank you very much.
Stephen is going to, um, to chair uh, his own questions, as it were. But Darren, do we need microphones? Do you have a microphone in your hand? So I guess so. So please wait for the roving mic and please say uh, who you are and your affiliation before you ask your question. Thank you. The first person to say jingle balls will be in Um, hi, um, I'm Lizzie from e tech and I was wondering, what do you think the um, implications of the COP are for countries sort of like Saudi Arabia and um, Venezuela, Nigeria, the big sort of fossil fuel exporting countries? Um, do, do you think it's going to mean anything to them? I mean, because obviously they have to virtually reconfigure their economy if they want to be in line with goals of carbon neutrality, etc. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, um, I don't think you can group them together. Saudi Arabia has clearly decided that the fossil fuel era has ended. And what Saudi Arabia is doing is to recognize that it's got the cheapest fossil fuels in the world. And that what it ought to do is to get as much money for it in the next 30 years because it won't be able to sell them afterwards, which is historically the opposite to what they have been doing. Historically, they said, We'll keep it because when there's a shortage of oil, then we'll get more money for it. But what they've now realised is that if you spread it, which is why they are amongst those who have been trying to keep the price down, because the price at this level, the tar sands and other things, become uh, not at all economically viable. Uh, and they, they've calculated in their minds that by the time you get to the stage, if, if the prices did rise, by the time you get to that stage, then people will be seeing the end of the fossil fuel theory anyway. So, so there are some people like that. Now, the Nigerians are in a different position because, uh, frankly, they are uh, much less um, centrally organized. It's much more difficult for them. Um, and uh, I have no doubt they produce their IDC. They were the last country to produce the IDC. They did it. pretty hope they produced that. So we'll see what uh, they're going to do. They've got a very good minister for this uh, um, uh, the environment. She uh, was the advisor to the... Um, uh, to, to the United Nations. She's uh, extraordinarily good. Um, but um, how, how able they will be, that's one of the problems. I mean, capability in these countries is really very difficult. And how able they'll be in a country which is in the throes of real terrorist action and the like, we don't know. But then we've just got to help those people. They're the people who we're really going to have to help them where the money is supposed to be there for. Because even if they are to some extent, a rich country, they're also a very poor country, and that's what we're going to have to do. So it will depend on, depend on who it is. And some will be much more difficult than others. Some countries are going to have to learn. Australia is going to have to decide that it's not going to open any new, more coal mines. The idea of opening a coal mine is an intolerable concept in today's world. And they've just got to learn that. And any of you know there's a great campaign going on, run by the president of Tuvalu, who... My problem with Tuvalu is that I have to admit that actually putting my finger directly on where Tuvalu is is more difficult than some countries. But uh, the fact, I mean, I know where it, roughly where it is, but, they, but, uh, but he's got everybody on, on side, and there's a remarkable young Australian who runs the Australian Institute um, who's running this campaign. There's got a lot of countries behind it, which is that there should be no <coughs> new politics. And that's what we're going to have to press on Australia, and then Australia is going to have to gets rid of some of its most polluting <coughs> coal-fired generation over the next uh, three or four or five years. And they've now got a sane Prime Minister, uh, and, they've the previous one, and um, I have some hope that they will be able to do that. The only trouble with Australia is it cannot, it cannot, both of it's tribal, they cannot get over the concept of having a common view. They, they don't have any concepts of consensus. Uh, and and, and the, 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 it's as bad on either side, I have to say. I mean, the Liberal the Country Party Coalition is just as bad as the Labour one, the Labour Party just as bad as the Liberal Country Coalition. Some hope now the Greens in Australia, because they've got a new leader, and uh, he seems to be uh, really rather sensible, so he may be able to drive this. Uh, previously, the UK was very difficult and was a, had a political view which was very difficult to anybody else. Uh, there's a gentleman at the back there, and then if you'd like to take that one to that gentleman right at the back there, and then we'll come forward. Hi, I'm Alex, a recent graduate from physics PhD here in Imperial. 
I'm trying to find my vocation. Uh, my question is, um, are cities more um, suited to empower sort of this green innovation rather than countries? Um, I have to, I have to say that the older I get, the more I think most answers to questions are not either or, but both and. And I think that really is true in this case. Uh, you have to have countries because they are overall the, the powerhouses. Sometimes you have something bigger than that, like the European Union, but, but normally the country is the powerhouse who can lay down in practical terms the, the way in which that bit of the world will meet the, 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 the COP21 requirements. But within the countries, I think there's a real place for cities and local government generally, and indeed provinces. If you look at um, Canada, under the um, uh, very uh, unhappy Conservative administration of uh, Harper, uh, a number of the provinces, uh, not necessarily of other political parties, but a number of the provinces were doing really good work. British Columbia's got the best uh, carbon tax system in the world. Um, uh, the other provinces are, are moving now, particularly. So, so it's, it may not be cities, it may be provinces, it may be uh, counties. If you look at Britain, it's surprising how many of the counties are actually doing a huge amount. I mean, I, my own county of Suffolk, uh, Suffolk, the greenest county, is a, is a great competitor with others to, to, to do things. Um, in a rural area, <coughs> which really will make a difference. And many of the things they're doing are making a difference. But I have no doubt that the cities, uh, if you look at what Oxford's doing, if you look at what um, uh, Birmingham is trying to do, if you look at what London is doing, one has to be very clear that they are very often in advance of countries. So uh, it's both out. Now, gentlemen there. Thank you. Uh, my name is also Alex. I'm a researcher in solar energy here at the college. Yep. Um, I know you're not a government representative, but I'm interested to know your Glad opinion that, yes. anyway. <laughs> um, how do we reconcile the present British government's appetite for pushing for international climate agreements with um, the reduction or the appetite for reduction and or uh, scrapping of um, renewable energy subsidies as we heard about in previous weeks and months? Well, um, the gentleman here for a minute. Um, uh, the, um, the first thing I, I think we have to do is to look at the, the proper background. But the Climate Change Committee was asked to say how much money would it cost to do between whatever date it was, three years ago, and 2020, to produce on a cost-effective basis what we needed to do between those dates to get to the decarbonisation target in the mid-2030s. Uh, That's what we were asked to do. And we said it would cost 7.6 billion. And the Chancellor gave us 7.6 billion. Now that's what happened. Unfortunately, the government wrongly guessed what the efficiency of offshore wind was going to be. There are two problems with, with the, the 7.6 billion. One is that it's based on the assessment of how much contracts for difference would be. And as you know, the contracts of difference are, based, are, are the difference between the price you um, agree with the uh, solar power or the offshore wind and the price of gas. So if the price of gas falls as it has fallen, the gap is bigger, so that what you have to pay is more. But we had put in to the figures of 20% uh, uh, cushion. So that has been covered by that. But what the government had said was that if you look at the efficiency of offshore wind uh, compared with the average efficiency of fossil fuels, we said, well, fossil fuels are average efficiency about 40%, that the efficiency of offshore wind would be about 27%. That was the government's decision. Actually, uh, the efficiency is much nearer 40%. So, of course, because it's more efficient, it's putting more and more energy into the grid. And by the time we get to 2020, we'll be paying for vastly more e e uh, energy than we had expected. So that, that's very good. It's a success. We should be cheering it. But the fact is that instead of a budget of 7.6 billion, uh, we're having a budget of something that's likely to be much closer to 11 billion. Now, no chancellor could have allowed that to go. Because we 
we said that was not the cost-effective route, if you see what I mean. Um, and so well, the Chancellor had to do something. Now, I'm not, in, I'm not going to argue that, that what he did and how he did it and the way it was presented was the right way to do it. All I'm saying is that you do have to accept that if you're not going to have a situation in which this is the one area of the budget that you don't have any control over at all, then that seems to me to be uh, a necessary change that you have to make, and you have to make some way of doing it. Now, I'm going to judge the Chancellor not on what he has done so far, but what he does to put in place and restrict that budget. And I don't even imagine, I'm certainly not a, um, a, uh, an advocate for the government. I'm entirely independent on this. I was chosen by a Liberal Democrat minister, First Minister of Scotland, who was Scottish nationalist, and the First Minister of Wales, who was a uh, a, a socialist and the first minister of Northern Ireland who was a Protestant unionist and I'm, I'm a conservative Catholic so quite how they did that I don't know but it does mean that I am independent and I, I merely say I do remember that at a time in which everything else has been cut back the two things which have not been cut back um, uh, our overseas development which has been increased and our budget and I have to accept that so I don't mind the fact that he feels that he has to restrain it within the kind of limits that I actually, or my predecessor actually suggested. What we're going to have to see between now and early next year is what has been put in its place, particularly in, in replacement of the Green Deal, what's going to happen about new houses, what's going to happen about uh, insulation, what's going to happen about a whole range of things. And I think that's probably where he ought to be. Now, the gentleman here is, uh, you got it, that's right. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Hayden, and I'm here in the Sustainable Energy Futures Program. And I was hoping to ask about your comment regarding how business will be crucial to achieving the goals outlined in the Paris Accords, uh, which were established by governmental promises. And coming from the United States, at least, uh, governmental regulation of business is an absolute sin. And I'm wondering if you could perhaps comment on how we can resolve the governmental construction of this document with the business-based implementation. Well, I think the fact is that business has been demanding this, uh, even large, even large business, and in even large American business. I mean, it is very interesting to see how the major American corporations have been quite rightly saying we cannot deal with this unless we deal with it on a, an international basis. It has to be an intergovernmental basis. And they were particularly concerned that you couldn't have a situation in which the European Union was doing things and America wasn't doing it, or they were doing different things. Um, and, and it is essential for business. So I don't think you'll have difficulty with that. Now, it's perfectly true that there is a part of America which doesn't like any of this. But in the end, it's rather like a religion that goes into snake charming. I mean, you know, it's there, and you have to put up with it, but it isn't actually the mainstream. You've actually got to get the mainstream under it. And the mainstream is totally different. I mean, in my businesses, we have a business in America. Um, I work in America a good deal. Uh, the change has been utterly huge since we started in America. I first started to work, um, in fact, with Coca-Cola um, probably 20 years ago. Uh, and in those days, it was really difficult. Um, but in the meantime, we got them to cease to use HFCs in their, in their refrigeration, which has changed the whole refrigeration industry. They now put back every drop of water that they take out as by, by uh, rainwater harvesting. There's a hell of a lot more to do, but I'm just saying those are the changes, which, which 20 years ago you wouldn't have been able even to talk about. Indeed, when I talked about water, they said, don't you ever tell anybody that water is our biggest uh, uh, constituent. Because they didn't like saying that. Now, of course, they worship it. You know, they, they revel in it. So I just think America is changing hugely. Um, uh, America is behind the rest of uh, uh, the advanced world, as a matter of fact, in this area. But I remember Doug Daft saying once, uh, the American industrialist, he said, um, he said uh, to somebody who was complaining, he said, no, of course I've got a, a European company to advise me on uh, environmental matters, because Europe is 10 years ahead of us. If I want to know where commerce is going to be in 10 years, I come to America. But if I want to know where environment's going to be in 10 years, we're very lucky. They're working it out in Europe for us. And we'll be there in 10 years' time. Now, there is a truth about that. And, and I think that's what's happening in America. So I'm not worried about the fact that 
uh, there will still be unpleasant people. I mean, ExxonMobil is an unpleasant business, and anybody who's an environmentalist shouldn't buy Exxon petrol. You just don't do it, not because it's going to make any difference to them, but I don't want to touch petrol. And uh, the same is true about uh, the organisations owned by the Coach Brothers. You know, there are nasty people, and they have to be, uh, you have to face it. But there's some very nice people, too, very good Americans who are really fighting very hard. And if you look at what Google is doing and what um, some of the very new industries are doing, so huge contribution. So I, I'm not worried. It'll, it'll happen. And in the end, it'll happen because they won't want to get out of They want to get the money. I mean, you know, it's a good thing. They, they'll, they'll see other people doing it. They won't want to miss out. Uh, next question. I think I'll have someone over there, but there isn't. So uh, the gentleman right in the middle, although he's difficult. And then the lady there. I'm Cameron. I'm on the Master's MSc Environmental Technology. I really like the statement you made at the beginning that every businessman in the world now knows the direction we're going, where we're trying to go. Um, but I'd like to ask to what extent is that true in the UK given some recent developments? So renewables has already been brought up, but another good example is um, the abolishment of the carbon capture and storage competition. And that completely contradicts what Amber Rudd made in her statement about the future of UK energy. So my interpretation of that is that's creating risk in the market for investors in low carbon technology. And so how do we get UK businessmen back on track with what we're trying to achieve? Well, I'm, um, I was very clear about the uh, CCS issue. Um, it seems to me that there is a real problem about uh, cancelling the, uh, the, the competition, which is what it was. Um, I, I have to say that I'm not sure that both projects would have met the requirements. And so far as I, I'm not, not privy to it, but looking at it, I, I think you first of all have to accept that that may not have happened. And secondly, um, I really am going to wait and see what happens, uh, although I've been very tough with government about it, I still think we've got to look and see what happens, because the, the real bit of CCS that we've got to get right is the industrial <coughs> bit. Actually, we've made it very clear to the government and to any investor that there's no point in investing in gas if you think you want to run gas after 2035, because there won't be any gas on the grid after 2035, except in the very most... Uh, I mean, backup of backups of backups kind of thing. So that's a very short period of time. And that's a good thing that the Climate Change Committee can say. We know that if you're going to decarbonise, as we have committed ourselves, and as we are statutorily required to do so, because we can't reach the 2050 target without decarbonising, if we're going to do that, then you've got to get all the gas off by uh, 2035. So in that case you are making a very clear statement to investors. So there are two sorts of statements we have to make. One is to investors to encourage them to do things. The other is to investors to make sure that they don't do things that are stupid, which would then tie you into infrastructure, which you don't want to be tied into uh, later on. So um, I think, uh, I have to tell you, I will be extremely uh, trenchant in criticisms if we don't have the other half but let's just give the government the chance of getting itself um, under control. It had to deal with this in the autumn statement because if it didn't deal with it in the autumn statement, it would mean that that would have to go ahead and it couldn't then actually withdraw it. So it made that decision. I have still to be convinced it's the right decision, but we shall still see as to what they actually do, um, particularly with the fact that under the energy bill, they have to keep these pipes available for uh, carbon capture and storage, which in itself is one of the most expensive bits of what you're doing. So we've got to look and see this program put together. And if we end up by having a program for uh, industrial carbon capture and storage, I think that will be probably a more sensible way to spend your money. And after all, it's not for me to say, which way to spend your money, but if you're doing that rather than the other, I don't think you can criticise for giving the wrong signals. But we shall have to see, and they've not got a long time to do it, because they've got to do it in time for us to be able to represent it and reflect it in our June statement. And if they don't, they'll find their feet put in the fire rather than just at it. <laughs> There's a lady there, yes. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Rachel Brooks, PhD student in the Department of Chemistry and a former resident of Vanuatu. Um, I, you mentioned some of the nasty people in the world. I was wondering if you consider Brian Ricketts to be one of them and whether you could comment on some of his uh, unfortunate statements that he made today regarding COP21. Well, I'm not sure I know what those statements were, so you'll have to give them to me. He said uh, something along the lines of they will be uh, in, held in history rather like, hated rather like um, the leaders of the slave trade. Um, so he's the Secretary General of Eurocoal, so lobbying for coal in Europe, um, and said that basically COP21 was uh, a lie and mob rule and things like this. Well, I'm, I'm a Tory uh, by uh, history, and therefore I always follow the money. I look and see where the money comes from, and if you get your money from coal and you say things like that, I know why you're doing it. It's very simple, and uh, um, you're doing it because um, that's what your paymasters have told you to do. Um, and that's all one has to say about him, and uh, I, I don't know him at all, and uh, I'm glad I'm not doing his job, and uh, I don't think you could have a vocation to do that job. I think that should be an empty job. <laughs> now, the next question. The gentleman here. Can I have another one after that? So we just um, call that here. And then the lady there, who's had a hand up before. So that's, that's Hi, it's uh, Jimmy Liu, Imperial College alumni. Um, I completely agree with you that the COP21 is an improvement and we're going to head somewhere because everybody signed up and it was a really difficult task to get everybody on board. The question that I think uh, a lot of people, um, my colleagues, have is how do you foresee commitments and actual bricks and mortar commitments being put to paper? Because, for example, you are in charge of the outcome. So you have a nice model. This model has a 450 ppm going into the future, going to 2050, and it, it fits nicely below 2% uh, compared to pre-industrial levels. But to get to that level, how do you foresee the upcoming COPs dealing with the, the, the actual putting pen to paper, the each step, the painfulness of getting people you know, to implement this? Thank you. Well, the answer is with difficulty. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not suggesting this is an easy operation, and it will, it will take a great deal of effort, but we do have the means of doing it. First of all, we have the money, as far as developing countries are concerned, and those who most need it. We have much greater commitment by countries that will be setting examples. We'll be able to show people that it's painful for everybody, but there are a whole range of answers. There'll be a lot more concern from business to offer answers which are not there at the moment, we can help quite a lot of countries just jump whole stages. Uh, I mean, I just think about countries that have never needed to have a fixed telephone line system because they've just had uh, uh, mobile phones. Well, now that's going to be true about grids. It's going to be true about all sorts of things that we'll be able to do. And working on smart grids and smart uh, metering in Britain, for example, will be able to be exported. People will be able to not to have to do the same thing again. I mean, even the Australians are being behind. I'm always having a little go at the Australians. But even being behind everybody else, the Australians, you know, will learn from other people. So, so there will be lots of, there will be lots of levers that we can use. And after all, the first gathering to go and see what has happened is only in three years' time. And uh, people will not want to be uh, uh, pillaged. I mean, in the end, that's why countries came along, why some of those countries that would like to have held out didn't want to, because they knew that, that the world was determined to do this. And we'll be checking on them too. So that's... Uh, the other thing is that some of the biggest... If you take the four biggest balloons, put the European Union, the United States, uh, India and China, if you look at those countries... They are all doing really serious things down this road. So, um, although India is still building coal-fired power stations, it actually now is passing that with the amount of solar that it's got. If you look at China, the amount that China is doing in terms of offshore wind, onshore wind, and solar is utterly different from what they were doing even two years ago. And China can now talk, it's talking about peaking by 2030. Actually, it's going to peak earlier than that. Actually, that's what's going to happen. And, and so I, I really do think that there are countries which are going to be very difficult. There are countries, I mean, America is going to have real difficulties. Uh, uh, and, and certainly if they pick any of the nincompoops who are standing for the Republican 
party, then they would really have difficulties. I, I do think that uh, it's very pity not to have a two-party system in America, but it doesn't have a two-party system. It has one party and the nincompoops, and, and that's, you know, that's, not, that's not a fair deal. That's right. Although it does give the rest of the world a good laugh every five, five years, four years, when you have, have a look at the people who are standing. It's only when you realise that they're being serious that you, uh, that you get worried. But no, I think there will be countries that have real difficulties. And, and we'll no doubt uh, have to fight our way through that. Now, there's uh, two more. There's a lady there, and I said somebody else whom I now can't see. There's another. Oh, there's Shauna. Do Shauna first, and then the lady there. Hi, John. Um, we've spoken a lot today about um, the difference between the mechanisms and the targets. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering what your view is on the importance of um, the narrative and the story we tell around climate change. Um, to, 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 to governments and, and the public, and what you think the role of things like behavioural change um, will be in the future? Well, I think the narrative is hugely important, and we don't get it right, and we don't use the right words, and we very often uh, confuse people by the sort of language that we use, and, and I'm very conscious of that. Um, if you want to see beautiful language describing what it's all about, read the papal encyclical. I just do say to it, don't, don't matter what your religion is, read it. Because it gives the most perfect example that tells the story in a way which actually brings all this together. Because it's about how we live in this world. It's about how we live with each other. It's about, about the greed and it's about uh, uh, the need for justice and fairness in the world. I mean, it is, and it's beautifully written. You can see that unlike almost any previous papal encyclical, it was almost entirely written by the present Pope. He wrote 80% of it. Whereas normally it's the other way around. The, the experts write uh, 80% and the Pope writes 20%. He, he wrote, and it is worth reading, just simply because it, it helps you to tell the story. It, it, as a narrative, it is very, very good. We're not good at the narrative at all, and we have to be much better at telling the story. I think one of the things we've got to do is to start thinking you're the sort of people who ought to think about it. And I, I'm not by training a communist, I'm a historian by training. Uh, I know a good deal about agriculture, and that's the technical thing that I contribute to. The, and my job is to try to get these people together and discover what the common view is and all that. But but the bit I do is on agriculture. Um, but there's a thing I've got that I don't still understand about economists, that I want to try to find a way through. Um, whatever you think about the Thames, about the um, seven um, the concept of, of, of having a seven barrel, uh, it just doesn't fit the way economists think about things. But as a simple non con I don't understand why it isn't sensible to spend a bit more money for 30 years in order to have free electricity for 100 years afterwards. I don't understand the argument that they do. Now, I'll come to you in a moment, but I'll tell you why I don't, tell you why I don't understand it. And this is really about the, about the story. And that is that ordinary people would do it. If you said to me, if you spend 20% more than the alternative to give your children free electricity for 30 years' time, that's what, as a father, I would do. And therefore, to have economists telling the, the, the country that as a country we shouldn't do that, that seems to me not to be sensible. And the public thinks it's not sensible too. So part of our problem with the story is that we aren't telling the story that the public would understand and accept. Now, you will explain to me why I can't. <laughs> yeah. Richard Green, I give some of the economics lectures on the yeah. SEF MSC, also head of the Department of Management here. I published a letter in the FT something like a year ago saying that the seven barrage, the, the issue with the seven barrage for me is that a 35-year contract that they want is far too short. I absolutely agree. It may, could well make an awful lot of sense to spend a high price for 35 years if we, the great British consumer, then get a century of very low-cost electricity. The deal that is being proposed, as far as I understand it, 
is that the great British consumer pays a high price for 35 years, and the company then gets very low cost electricity that they sell to our grandchildren yeah, at a rather high price, yeah. which is a slightly different matter. Okay. So 135 year contract, expensive at first, very cheap afterwards. And I am very sorry, I'm going to be under strong moral pressure from a colleague to go and meet some researchers from another country that we're working on and have an appointment at 7.30, but thank you very much indeed. Well, <laughs> well if, you can, if we can deliver it on that basis, I'm very happy to. I just, I just use it as an example of having to have a story which the public understand, and, and barrages of the public understand. They understand, they feel that that is wasted energy running away, so if you could do something with that, then why don't you do it? And it becomes baseline, base uh, level, because you know 50 years before when it's going to produce electricity and when it isn't that's all. Now, the lady there who has waited patiently. Hi, I'm Elisa Collado. I'm um, recently graduated from a PhD in chemistry working in solar cells. Um, I wanted to see your views on how does the Trans-Pacific Partnership matches with the agreements that were done in the COP21? Well, I'm not sure I'm technically um, able to give an answer to that on the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Um, I just want to make a very general point. Uh, I made some very clear and tough comments about the European Union. The advantage the European Union has is that it is a serious permanent relationship with a constant interaction between democratic governments through the Council of Ministers, through the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Parliament, and, and, and through the, the way in which the Commission is appointed. So that this is not something that just happens from time to time when you have a Congress. It's a constant operation. It works together like that. Uh, many of these partnership arrangements uh, never managed to do that. If you look at the Andes one, if you look at um, uh, even the North American free trade area, if you look at all that, they, they don't work like that. Now, the very thing which um, uh, UKIP uh, doesn't like is the very thing which you need to have, which is that you have to embed it in the way in which you act and the way in which you operate. And, one of my problems with the, those sort of rather traditional connections which are, 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 which are raised is that they, 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 they take a photograph at a moment in time which happens to work <laughs> and, and then the world moves on. <coughs> and you, we've got to find a, a sort of mini way of doing what the European Union does so successfully if these things are going to work on a permanent basis. Right, last question. The gentleman with a beard. That I think I can say without any uh, difficulty. Thank you very much for your talk, Rupert Morris. Um, just to, uh, uh, I've looked very closely at the documentation, and I haven't seen any mention uh, of deforestation, thinking in particular of the Amazon, but especially Indonesia. And um, I, I don't know if it has been mentioned. It hasn't been mentioned strongly in the British press. Could you... Let us well, know well, what there. was agreed it is on there, that. And actually, it's more important uh, because of this very important decision that in the latter half of this century, where we have committed ourselves not to emit any more than nature can actually absorb. Now, once you do that, then you begin to recognise that now you've actually got to protect that absorption ability and that you've got to enhance it. And uh, I think that's the most important uh, marker that we could possibly have. And when I saw that, which is, again, entirely unexpected, nobody thought that we would get that. Because what that says is that we will move not only to a low-carbon economy, but we will move, move to an economy where we actually respect what the Earth can do. Now, I, I find that such an exciting uh, attitude, so different from the conquest attitude that we had about the world. Again, it's one of those absolutely seminal changes. It's, it's not the first time it has it, um, and you go back to St. Francis and see uh, that expressed in different ways, but, but it is for international 
business, a very important thing to say to them, because it means that protection of the forests and extension of the forests becomes financially a very sensible thing to do, because they are going to be of real importance if you're going to get this balance right, because if you, uh, if you say it's what you put in and what can come out, you can put in more if you've got more to, to absorb it. And so there is a real trade-off here. And uh, I think that really covers the, the fact. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.